Beautiful like a town planner's brochure is the Wilhelmsburg neighborhood in Hamburg with its famous electric cars. Twelve buildings produce heat and electricity from the sun and are linked by one of the first sharing networks in the world. Our building is linked to the office block opposite through a network of proximity heat and the surplus energy that we have on sunny days is sent back into this local network. For the inhabitants of this neighborhood, it's theoretically possible to resell their surplus energy to their neighbors. If the energy isn't all used, it is sent back into the public network and our meter goes backwards. It really does. I've seen it. Meters that turn backwards are the dream of every consumer. But it's below this neighborhood that one discovers the technological headache of the energy internet. Until now, networks have been centralized, with energy produced in the power station flowing out to the customers. The challenge was to predict consumption in order that the quantity of energy sent out was equal to that used. But if consumers start producing part of their own energy and even sending the excess back into the network when they have too much, the production consumption balance becomes even more tricky to manage. That's when digital technology comes into play. It became necessary to establish some kind of intelligence in the network. In concrete terms, we added fiber optics in parallel to the energy network. That network is constantly measuring how much energy is being consumed at every junction. And it also enables us to measure the quantity of heat distributed by each customer in order to balance production with consumption. An IT network runs over the top of the energy network. All the consumption and production data is analyzed by computers, which can thus direct the energy to where it is needed and keep the network balanced. These highly intelligent networks are known as smart grids. There's a huge amount of intelligence behind this system. But the technological problems aren't all solved yet. The problem with green energies is that they aren't always available when one needs them. We tend to want to turn the heating on when the sun isn't shining and to turn on the lights when it's dark. The challenge is to store these intermittent energies. In Hamburg, several cutting-edge solutions are being tested, including these drapes, which are not made of green plastic. The green drapes are new. They naturally absorb the heat from the sun and release it when the temperature drops in the room. But for the moment, despite some bold and very expensive attempts to save it, most of the energy that isn't immediately used is still lost, and the sun therefore only covers a few percent of the neighborhood's needs. So, what's the situation right now in terms of the shift in energy supply to our towns? On the one hand, some neighborhoods with cutting-edge technology are emerging. As yet, they're not very profitable and are, above all, large-scale tests. Gambles on the future from the big energy companies. And on the other hand, in all our towns, houses and public buildings are gradually becoming covered with solar panels and wind turbines in an attempt to lower energy bills. And all these green producers scattered around are starting to raise questions about the role of the historically huge central power stations. Early on, when I first started introducing this to the European business community, and especially the power and utility companies, let me say the energy companies were not happy with that. And most of them still aren't happy with it. What I said to them is get used to this fact. We have millions of people producing their own green electricity. In 10 years from now, tens of millions of people around the world are going to be producing their own green electricity. So if you're a power and transmission company, we say to you, we'll sell you the electricity, your new mission, manage energy flows for clients. The quest for models goes on, but the percentage of renewable energy being produced is doubling every two years around the world and is just tipped 20% in Germany. 
The situation is such that even the major specialists in centralized energy are arming themselves with digital technology in order to integrate all these new sources of energy into their networks. Every year, ERDF invests over 3 billion euros in modernizing the network. A good part of this goes on smart grids, on the development of smart software, on setting up sensors, and on installing remote controls. And we're going to continue this on the low-tension network with Linky. Linky, the green meter that will soon be moving into every French household, informs the network manager of the precise electrical activity of each household. This is the foundation stone of new energy networks, revolutionary networks where ideally renewable energies will be combined with digital communication. All through history, when we look back at it, we see that the great economic turning points are when new communication revolutions emerge, converge, and manage new energy revolutions. Together they create a new platform, a new infrastructure for a new economic paradigm. And these paradigms not only shift the economic uh, way we organize life, they shift our living patterns, uh, our habitats. They shift our consciousness. They shift the way we organize our relationship to nature and to each other. According to Rifkin, the two first industrial revolutions, based on energies that are difficult to extract and requiring massive capital injections, led to a society that was centralized around these interests, a pyramidal society, with, at the top, the people providing the finance, and a little farther down, the workers invited to make it profitable. This system is also known as capitalism. But the energy internet will be the great leveler. Every building becomes a micro power plant, and billions of people literally produce their own power. It's power to the people, literally and figuratively. This region of North Pas-de-Calais begins a great journey. This is the region that pioneered the first industrial revolution. But how does the return of power to the people resonate in the Lille Conference Center? Rifkin's plan for the Nord Pas de Calais region promises a slightly more complex power struggle. The cost of the energy mutation is estimated at some 150 billion euros over 30 years, which will come from public grants, personal savings, and private investment, mainly from the digital industries. We already have billions of sensors. We're going to have 100 billion of these sensors pretty quick. Who will profit from this new paradigm? I'd say that we're in a world that is totally unregulated in that respect. And the historic players will be in competition, as we've seen in the telecom sector, with new arrivals. For these new arrivals, the energy internet is promising new markets to conquer. Because in France, the Rifkin plan is throwing into question the central role of the country's historic energy producer, EDF. It's a culture shock for sure. He is American. He doesn't understand what public sector power represents. He knows what business is. But at the same time, he's telling us that producer cooperatives will join forces with consumers. He's telling us that we are experiencing the emergence of lateral power. And help the rest of us move on the road you're taking to a new world. Thank you. Will the Nord Pas de Calais region be the emblem for a new lateral power embodied by cooperatives of motivated citizens? Or the spearhead for new energy and digital superstructures? We'll find out in 2050.